All right, let's get into this. So our first speaker today is uh, the one and only Wes Boss, somebody who needs no introduction, over at Syntax FM, uh, doing incredible things for the web for as long as I've been a part of it. Thank you so much, Wes, for being here. Welcome to the stage. Hey everyone, thanks so much for coming out. Uh, my name's Wes, as we said, I got a lot of cool shit to, to show you, so I'm gonna skip past all of that. This talk today is about coding with AI and building things with AI, so kind of the two parts of your job that you might be interested. And I kind of want to start off with just a couple things, is I've got nothing to sell you here. I'm not some huckster, I'm not a Web3 crypto guy changing lanes. And um, I'm just an enthusiastic web developer, and I find this stuff super handy. Um, so if you're skeptical about all this AI stuff, uh, me too, and it's good that you are. But I got some cool stuff to show you. So I think that AI gives developers a massive boost in their productivity, in the code quality, and at the end of the day, the type of stuff that they are able to build. We're still figuring out a lot of this stuff. We're really early days. Um, but I don't think that this is going anywhere. So it's not something that I think you should be ignoring. So the first thing is like different mediums. How can you use these AI tools to help you code? And probably the one that most of us have interacted with is, is ghost code, right? You start writing a, uh, a function or something like that, and it will try to guess what you want and autocomplete that for you, right? That's pretty handy. There's lots of different services that have implemented this type of thing. Um, we have it in the CLI, lots of CLI tools where what's the git undo thing? I just committed something and I, I, that was wrong. I want to like amend the commit. What's the weird git thing for that? Well, you just type it in English and it will translate it to a bash command. Uh, chat apps is, an, is another really popular one where you simply just ask it your question. It will bring you back a lot of uh, some code that you want. Um, pull requests, I think this is super easy, it's super great, is it sucks writing pull requests. This is what I did in this, right? And you've commit messages and whatnot, but given the code that you changed and the pull requests that you have, um, it can write a whole bunch of text for you. This, these ones are just popping up lately. V0.dev from Vercel, Visual Copilot. There's an open version of it. But this is pretty wild in that you can just type what you want, and it will spit out UI components the other, out the other end. Um, and it's, like, it's iterative, so you can say, oh, yeah, we'll move that to the right-hand side, and the background shouldn't be white, and make the buttons icons, not text. Um, and through kind of like how we code, through lots of implement revisions, you can get good looking code and UI components out the other end. There's lots of experiments as well. Like uh, there's Copilot Voice, which is really interesting to me, both from like an accessibility point of view, but also like you got your mouse, your keyboard, is your voice a third input to help you code? Like can we have a gas pedal for coding? That would be pretty sweet. Um, brushes, so just select your code, make it accessible, add types, all that good stuff. Prompts as a new syntax, so just writing text instead of actually writing the code. Boilerplate generation. So like, why AI for this stuff? I think it's faster than Googling. It's context aware of the problem you're trying to solve, and because of that, it solves your problem, not somebody else's problem. You don't have to find, oh, this person had a similar problem, let me adapt it to my code base and my variables. It knows all about that already. So let's switch over to using AI to code and how you can use it in your day to day. First one, and as someone who builds a lot of courses, I find this extremely helpful, uh, which is creating dummy data. So give me an array of people. Each person has a first and last and age properly. Each person also has a nested array of one to three jobs, which have a start date, optional end date, description, a manager, and the same property, generate types. Like what a vomit of something that I just put in there, and boom, out the other end, you get all of that data, right? If you're trying to code something, you don't necessarily have the data for that just yet, those back-end devs take forever to do everything, we know. Um, so you can just generate a whole bunch of like really good-looking, accurate data 
Um, and you can even say, like, include German names that are very long. And you can hit all those UK use cases where lorem ipsum might not hit it. Add types to this code, right? Look, it knows about your variables, and it can infer a lot of that stuff. So you can say, hey, add types. So it creates types, and we'll implement them and, and slot them into the code that you want. Do the work, you know? Like, uh, this is really great for scaffolding out, like, your your first half an hour of actually coding is select the things on the page and then say, all right, well, uh, write a function to paint the video frame to Canvas as frequently as possible, give the entire output in TypeScript, and boom, you got it out the other end. Make reusable. I find this one really handy as well, is if you are just working on like a proof of concept, you're just hacking away, trying to get something to work, all right, it seems like it's working. Now I got to like clean it up and make it, put it into a class or a reusable function, something like that. You can just highlight it and say, make this into a reusable library with best practices. I want to be able to pass in a selector or string or elements. Generate CSS. I have this HTML, which is 10 different cards, right nth child to rotate them between negative two and two. Boom. Uh, write a regex. I hate writing regexes, right? So write a regex that matches all of the orders in this sentence, right? Order dash one, two, three, four, five, six, ORD dash one, two, three, et cetera, and it will, out the other end, give you a regex. But then, like, should we be trusting these robots that give us this random code? Probably not, because that could be catastrophic. Uh, but you say, explain this regex. Show me what the parts mean. So it'll break it down into all the different pieces. Uh, write tests for this regex. That's probably a good way to test if the, the actual code works, right? So you can write a whole bunch of tests that see if the regex will work. Um, and I, th like, this is not like an example that I made up. Like, this is actually the first thing that popped out, and I just said vtest run, and it, it ran. All of them passed, right? Uh, Test-driven development. So, okay, if you don't know what the function is, you can write the test first and say, write the function that satisfies the following tests. Um, it can help you understand different errors that are failing. It gives you feedback on a lot of the errors. So, all right, uh, that code you gave me, I get this error. Assertion, I expected the bananas, but it was with a capital B, and it will give you a bunch of feedback. It's not perfect. This is the one that I couldn't get it to totally fix, but it's not like it's going to do absolutely everything. Maybe one day it will, but I certainly saved myself at least half an hour, 45 minutes of actually coding, um, and I was able to move along and not have to write regex as my entire day. It's really good at like complex inputs. So FFmpeg is a library I use a lot for concatenating video and audio files. So no longer do I have to peruse the forums for somebody who did something similar. Now I can just say, give me a command for merging three files, overlay captions, and add music from this MP3. And like, holy smokes, look at that. Uh, and then, OK, well, you have this. Should you just blindly run it? No, explain it to me, right? It'll break it down into all the different pieces that make a lot of sense. Uh, install these. I love this one. Is you're looking at a tutorial, and it's like, all right, import. They have like six imports. You're like, oh, man, I need these four different libraries. Let me one by one copy paste them into my NPM install. No, just say, uh, this is the, the question mark here says, I just, just install these, and I just paste the code. And then at the other end, it'll give you the NPM install commands. Just little, like, quick little speed ups like that are so handy. I could show you cool examples all, all day, but let's change lanes and look at how to integrate AI into your applications, right? You probably work on some sort of website or app during the day, and you're thinking, hmm, like, what could we add to this website that would make it better for our customers, for our, anyone that comes to the website? So first thing we do, we have a podcast called Syntax. It's a web, about web development. And we have them transcribed by uh, an AI service. So we say transcribe. And out the other end, it gives you a transcription of every single thing. And it gives you who said the word, every single word, that when it starts and when it ends, and all kinds of good information about what it is. This is called an utterance, something that was said. Um, and then what we want is we want to be able to give it the transcript from the podcast and say, like, 
give me a title, a description, a summary, give me some tweets that I can tweet about this specific podcast, tally how long people have been talking in this type of thing. So you come up with what's called a prompt, right? The prompt is what you tell the AI, I want you to do this thing. So summarize the provided transcript into very succinct bullet points, each containing a few words. The actual prompt is probably 40 times that long because you have to really work at it to get it to do exactly what you want, but you get the idea. You ask it to do something, you give it the entire transcript as well as some timestamps. Then we have that whole prompt and there's this idea in AI called tokens, meaning that a, a token limit is how much text can you send the AI um, before it's not able to generate something for you. So a one hour podcast is like kind of every word is a token, but then like periods are tokens and new lines are tokens. So a one hour podcast transcribed is about 15,000 tokens. Um, and then you also have to save space for the output. How much text do you want to get back from these AIs? So we usually save about 1,000 tokens for the show notes that it's going to send back to us. So the different models that are out there, there's dozens of different models out there. Um, it's always a trade-off between quality, speed, and price. So some of them have, some of them are extremely cheap, but you can only send 4,000 tokens, right? Like that doesn't even cover the like a quarter of the podcast. And then some of them have 100,000, and we're starting to push the, the boundaries. So what do you do when, like the, the one that most people are using right now is this 3.5 Turbo 16K, meaning you can put 16,000 tokens into it. But what happens if you want to use the, the better one, but the token limit is, is half of what you're expecting? Well, you use AI, <laughs> meaning that like you ask AI, hey, here's a sentence, can you summarize it by 70%, 50%, however much? So I would measure how long the transcript is and say, all right, we're over by 20%. So can you make this 80% smaller so it fits, it fits in? So you give it this thing. Do not take any details out, but make it as succinct as possible. And then it will give you, like here we, we put 96 tokens in and we get 80 out. Then you take all of those summarized utterances, and you craft the prompt. So you say, summarize the podcast. This is the huge prompt I was talking about. Give me all of these different things. You craft the request. So you say, you are a web development podcast summarizer. This episode is number 432, and this is the name. Here is what I want you to do. And here is the entire summary, or the entire condensed uh, transcript that will fit within that token limit. Um, and then out the other end, you get very good uh, summarization, title, description, topics. Uh, you get a detailed summary, so this is really nice, with timestamps, so it will know when you have changed topics. Like even if, if I gave it this talk, it would probably say, all right, Wes is now talking about different coding uh, platforms. Now Wes is talking about using uh, ChatGPT. Now he's talking about tokens. Uh, it will give you a bunch of different tweets, which are, are pretty good. Although the AI seems to love using exclamation marks and emojis. And I spent at least an hour trying to not it tell it not give me emojis, which is hilarious. <laughs> Speaker times, how long did each person talk? Uh, although that's like one downside with the AI right now is it's not very good at math, which is kind of funny. Um, which is, is really funny because we talked to some people on the podcast about like, what is AI? And it, it's math at the end of the day. It's very deterministic. Um, it's a pure function. AI is a pure function, but it can't add numbers together very well. Uh, it'll give you links that you reference. I love this because if you talk about a link but don't record it anywhere or you reference a website, head on over to the FITC website. It would try and figure out what the FITC website is given its vast knowledge of the world. Next one let's talk about is embeddings. This one is this one's really cool. I like this one a lot. Um, so this is like a quick little demo that I made up for syntax, which is you ask it a question, like uh, what are the DIY tools that Wes has talked about in the podcast? And then out the other end, it'll say here are some highlights on DIY tools. These are the episodes in which Wes referenced it. So I referenced using an oscillating tool twice, um, a nail gun. And the fact that it knows that 
as a DIY tool and not like a, like a build tool is so cool because they're both tools. And if you were just to match the word tool, it would find all of that. But the, the, it knows on many levels what type of tool you're talking about. So how does it know about 600 hours of transcripts? Do you have to um, like train your own model? Um, and the answer to that is it, it doesn't know about all of our podcast episodes, right? Uh, so embeddings are the answer there. So what you do is you take every single utterance, which is a sentence or two that each of us have said, and you convert that into an embedding. And that costs peanuts to actually do. Um, so three bucks for the entire uh, 680 episodes of everything we've talked about. Um, so I'm going to take a, just a pause from that and just show you a simpler example. So I went on Twitter and I said, reply to this tweet with what you did today. I'm doing a demo on cosine similarity. So people replied, I have lots of meetings and meetings, meetings, meetings. And I take the text, which is that, and I convert it into an embedding. And an embedding is a bunch of numbers that somehow represent what those things are. And it tells me, all right, those things are 93% similar. And then you can pass those back to the AI and say, why are these two things similar? And it will say, because they both involve gatherings. And they're like, ah, oh, that makes sense. Was, they both have the word meetings in it, right? That's, that's kind of impressive. Uh, with this one, uh, using whatever, I was able to make a really good drop down and built a styled accordion menu. 82% similar. Why? Because they both involve in creating UI components, even though the, the language there hardly overlaps, right? I carved a spoon for the first time. It was rough, but a pleasant experience. I finished a chicken coop today. Those are 80% similar because they're both satisfying DIY projects. What? That's wild that it knows that. And it's wild that these numbers mean chicken coop and carving a spoon. And the, you take this, it's basically an array of 1,600 numbers or something like that. And that array of numbers is you're able to uh, use cosine similarity, which is some math equation, don't know. Uh, and it will figure out where the closest ones are to that, right? So what are the uses for that? Search, classification, or tagging. If you want to group items together with the podcast, we want to say, all right, like, uh, here is, here's one podcast on uh, React, right? And then it will, given what we've said in other podcasts, even if we don't have the word React in the title, it will know, all right, these are similar to what the person has talked about. Anomaly detection, right? This is not similar at all to any of these types of things. So maybe this is spam, or maybe this is something that shouldn't be included. Uh, similar items, similar images. That's how all, a lot of these like Google Lens are getting really good. And it's not just finding the same image. It knows what's in the image. And that's using things like embeddings. So back to the syntax example. I took every single utterance that I've ever said here, and we convert it into an embedding, right? And it says, here we go, 1,536. So it's just an array of 1,536 numbers. Um, and then when I get something like, what does Wes think about vanilla JS? What I do is I take that question, convert it into an embedding. So now I have an array of numbers that is, represents what does Wes think about vanilla JS. Then you find similar utterances. So you, you have that number and say, hey, like, what are other things that you, Wes has said that are similar to this question, right? Again, the math comes in there and does its thing. And then what I do is I take that utterance and I find the two sentences I've said before that, the two sentences I've said after that, um, and then I put them all into one big text blob, right? Now it's no longer numbers. I put them back into text, and I say, these are things that I've said about vanilla JS, I think. Then you take a prompt. You say, you're a helpful assistant. Your tone is smart but casual. Given the following context, these are six clips from different shows, answer this question, what does Wes think about vanilla JS? And then, boom, out the other end, you, you pass that to an, any AI model. It doesn't have to be the same one you created the embeddings with. 
um, and at the other end, it will ge generate that actual answer. So you see these websites having their own chat assistant on their website. This is exactly how they're doing it. They're going through every single forum post, every single documentation, every single tweet, Every, single, every piece of content they've ever created, they're feeding it into embeddings and then finding similar items. So the question is, like, like are we screwed? Like, are, are we out of a job? Is this stuff going to take our job? Am I just going to be able to stand here with a microphone and say, like, make a sweet website with the video player on it, you know? Um, I don't think so. I don't know, but this is, this is what I think. I think that AI gives us a, a, a big boost in the type of stuff that we can do. So now we, are, we have like a superpower, and we're able to just make, it's a massive leap forward in the type of stuff and the amount of stuff that we are able to create. So technology is not like, we're not just gonna be like, you know what, Friday's off. AI is, is doing our thing. Like, that'd be nice. Yeah, there's probably a lot of people in this room that think, think we should probably do that, but, uh, we're not going to stand still. We're just going to make bigger and better stuff with the technology. So it's going to be less about centering divs and more about pushing all the boundaries. So what we need to remember here is that we are problem solvers as developers. Our tools are changing. Don't ignore it. Stay sharp. Thank you. Great. Wes, why don't you join me on, on the down. interrogation couch? So uh, for anybody who wants to ask questions, make sure you go to Slido. We're going to get the QR code for that. There it is. Um, and I'm going to kick us off All right. with, uh, with this one here. So what do you think about new developers using AI when they're learning to code? Uh, great. Like, what do you think about kids using spell check when they're learning to think? Probably not good, because that's not what I did, but we're not going to stop that, you know? Even my, my daughter's learning to, to spell right now, and you know what she does on the iPad is she hits the, hits the microphone button and says the word when she can't spell it, and then she looks at it, and like, maybe that's bad, maybe, maybe that's, that's good, but they're, they're able to get it done, so I think new developers need to understand, like, yeah, pause and understand what you're doing. All of us developers, when you get this code back, pause, make sure you actually understand this thing before you deploy it. Don't just blindly deploy it, but um, it, it's a tool for all of us. So it's, it's like, oh, new developers shouldn't use autocomplete, you know? Like, of course we're going to use these tools that make us faster and better and give us more context. Absolutely. Uh, all right, so you said that we shouldn't be worried about AI, but is there a type of developer that should be worried about AI? Ah, oh, that's a good question. Um, I, the, unfortunately, like the tech industry is just constantly moving forward, constantly changing, and that gives a lot of people anxiety because it's it's just this moving bus at all times. Um, and I, I think the answer to that is unfortunately, yeah, you have to you got to stay up to date. That's why I, I'm doing this talk. Is you you have to embrace this stuff. Um, it is going to be a significant tool in the future. And if you sit there being like, hmm, I prefer hand-coded because I sell my code on Etsy, you know, I don't think that's going to pan out. Uh, I'm just imagining somebody's selling code on Etsy. <laughs> but you know what I mean, like artisan, <laughs> handcrafted, notepad++, plus plus, like no right. autocomplete, nothing. And yeah, there's probably a, there's probably a, uh, like a somewhere for that type of person, especially if they're genius. But I think for most of us regular developers, uh, you got to embrace it. For us mere mortals. Yeah. <laughs> I always thought it was like pedestrian developers, you know? Yeah. Uh, so one from the audience here. What is your favorite or most used AI? Um, I, like my day-to-day -day is I use Raycast and I just pop that open. Um, but then I've been, that's using GPT 3.5. Um, and then, like, I don't use ChatGPT on the website just because, like, my little tool does it quickly. Mm. And then I use GitHub Copilot quite a bit. And then just yesterday, I got access to the Vercel's v0.dev, 
which is you take a prompt, and it will kick you out uh, React components using Tailwind, um, which is pretty cool. And, and now a lot of people are saying, well, I don't use Tailwind in React, so it's not for me. You're missing the point, because of course we'll be able to make it work for whatever framework that you're using. The point is that I literally pushed a button on my computer and spoke what I wanted, and a, a React component for a video player came out the other end. <laughs> it's a lot. It's a, I, like I've been doing this for a long time, and this is very overwhelming to me. It's very exciting. <laughs> it is, uh, yeah, it is exciting. And like, I'm excited about it, right? Like, it, I, I, people, you can just, there's like, there's probably a, a mid area between being as stoked on it as I am, being a huckster, and being like, no, that's, that's dumb, right? Mm. And I, that's probably where you should be. <laughs> Health, healthy skepticism. Yeah, right? healthy yeah. skepticism. Uh, okay, so here's one that I think is, is a really good question. When shouldn't we be reaching for AI? Oh, that's a good question. A lot of people will say, well, don't use AI for like modern code because it's been trained in 2021 and it doesn't know about that stuff. But you just have to give it context. Like with the new Anthropic 100,000 tokens, you could literally paste like a majority of your code base, if not your entire code base, into it and say, here's my code base, paste. I have these questions about it, right? Mm. So when shouldn't you use it? I, I don't know. Like it's, it's not really about like, oh, I'm not using it there. It's more about, oh, here's a nice use case where I like to use it, you know? It's, it's more of like an opt-in in these different situations versus a, I'm not gonna use AI for this. Yeah, but, I get oh, you. also, another thing is, um, if you work for a major corporation, because like, we're, we're pasting secrets into this robot, who knows <laughs> where that's going, you know? Like, <laughs> who, yeah, we don't know. It might be feeding some sort of like demon or spy, so. <laughs> Uh, okay, all right. <laughs> so, all right, so, so everybody here heard your pitch. They're excited about it. Yeah. Um, if we want to get the most out of this, what skills should we focus on building to get, like, to leverage this best? Um, I, I think it's just, just playing with it a lot is, like, a joke that my wife has, it's not even a joke, but she often will come to me and says, can you Google this? You're really good at Googling, you know? And like probably a lot of you have had that situation as well. It's like, I bet I can find this because I know how to Google. And like <laughs> some people are better at Googling. And that will be, I think, somewhat similar with being able to write prompts for this type of stuff. I, I think like people are just like prompt engineers. I wouldn't go that far because if you have to specialize in it, like. Shouldn't the AI help you out there? You know, shouldn't it be a little smarter than that if you have to know how to talk to it? But on the flip side, I think being able to, to write good prompts and, mm -hmm. and to use it, just, just whenever you reach for Google, pause a second and try to say, like, maybe I could try use AI for this type of stuff. And you just get a little bit more comfortable with it. I think it's, it is a little ironic that the thing that will finally teach developers to value good communication skills is AI. <laughs> a robot, yeah. <laughs> I gotta be able to talk to the computer so it'll do my work for me. <laughs> um, okay, so here's, here's a question that got a few upvotes. Uh, isn't there more of a risk of bad actor developers affecting our industry using AI to mass produce for-profit, lazily developed code sites and designs? Yes, yes, and I, I, I don't know. Like, I'll give you an example. I posted a t-shirt design on Twitter a couple days ago. There was 47 websites bootleg that t-shirt and are selling it because people are able, to, they have robots that find the tweet, robots that convert it into a t-shirt design, robots that deploy 47 bootleg t-shirt design things. And yeah, that, that stuff is unfortunate. And I don't necessarily know that I have the answer to that, but I think that it will probably be a net win um, on that type of stuff. And like, also, like, I'm so skeptical of so many things recently. Like, I get lots of cold pitches and emails from people, and you used to be able to tell when they're cold pitches, but now they're, they're written by AI. And like, I got, someone did a screen recording of my YouTube channel, and they were moving their mouse around, 
And I could tell that that was a, a script where they recorded my YouTube video and moved a mouse around, took a, took a screen recording video, and then emailed it to me. And it's just like the just like garbage of that. So now, like whenever I get cold pitches, I, I just like, this is garbage. Mm. And I value my relationships, meeting people at conferences like this, so much more because of how fake people can be. That's... Yeah, I've, I've noticed the same thing. Um, the, the endless chain of like, just following up on this one yeah, more time. It's like, yeah, it's, it's oh. awful, the, all that stuff that pops up. But I think we will adapt to, like our bullshit detectors are, are extremely high right now, or heightened mm -hmm. at least. I think that's, yeah, like they say that, that devs are immune to advertising, right? It's because we get exposed to it nonstop and we know how it works. Yeah. And I think this will be a similar thing. We, we learn quickly how to spot something yeah. that is not working. And it, it kind of sucks for like, like the rest of the world mm -hmm. because like I see a lot of stuff and it's like I can s clearly tell that this is, is fake and a scam or like whatever. But like unfortunately like the rest of the world doesn't see that. Yeah. Uh, at least not yet, you know? Like maybe we'll start to uh, be heightened a bit more. And that's actually a fair point because like there have always been scams and yeah. the scams have always taken advantage of people who aren't familiar with the way the scams mm -hmm. run. And so it's not that AI is going to create scams, it's that AI is another vector for people to do the same terrible things that terrible people do, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, okay, I've, I've got another one here. So now that this is gonna be the way that a lot of developers enter the industry, AI will be here from day one for them. Yep. Do you have any thoughts on how it will or should change how we train and educate new developers? Yeah, that, that's a good question. I've struggled with, should I put Copilot on my training courses? You mm -hmm. know, and, and my answer to that so far has been no, because I move fast enough. Sometimes, like, people actually want to sit there and understand that type of thing. But, um, yeah, it will probably be part of, like, even in a lot of my courses when, or when I'm doing, like, a video, and I am problem solving or debugging, mm -hmm. I show myself, opening the AI tools or highlighting it and saying add types and stuff like that. So I'm like, yeah, this is just another piece of our workflow that we're, we're going to be doing. Like we're not teaching people to code in Notepad anymore. We're showing them how to get VS Code and all these bundlers and live reload and all these things. So again, this is another tool in our tool belt. Um, this one is just fairly significant. Yeah, feels like a feels like a big shift. But then again, like I remember I, I was one of the notepad developers, right? I didn't yeah. have an IDE or anything. And I remember when stuff like Sublime Text first came out, there was a similar kind of like, that's cheating. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> and, yeah. And so now we take it as, it, it's unfathomable to imagine not using something that has syntax highlighting or, or yeah. autocomplete yeah. or things like that. But, you know, it was. At some point, it was very much considered like, oh, that's not real engineering, that's yeah. cheater engineering. And so I think we'll probably see the same thing here. Even like the auto formatters. Like, you remember mm. how much time we used to spend <laughs> indenting our code and like having opinions on how you indent your code? Who cares? <laughs> Hit the save button. <laughs> it's indented. Move along with your life. Like, I cared so much about ordering CSS properties and indenting like brackets. Unless you're one of those psychos that puts a, the if statement curly bracket on the next line, <laughs> then we should talk. <laughs> but. Yeah, it's just not a problem anymore. We're focusing on bigger stuff. That is, yes, all right, excellent. So let's, uh, let's, let's dig in here. We got, we got a lot of questions. Y'all did an excellent job of asking Good awesome job, questions. Thank you. Um, and I'm, I don't even think we're gonna have time to get to them all because I think we've got about five minutes left. No, three minutes left. We got time for maybe like one more. As much more. time, seven, five, six, seven, eight. Eight minutes, we can go all day. All right. Uh, <laughs> Let's, uh, let's see, what scares you about AI? Um, Besides 47 bootleg t-shirt sites. Yeah. What scares me about AI? Wow. I, I don't know, maybe, maybe the fact that we become apathetic towards so much stuff, mm. you know? Like, like one thing is, um, like a lot of art is hard to appreciate because I'm looking close and saying, is that, is that mid journey? You know, and that sucks, you know? And, 
and I bet we will probably find different ways to appreciate artists, but it's, yeah, it's super cool. I pay for mid-journey, and it's super cool that I can do all that stuff, and I find it a super handy tool to mock up t-shirts and things like that, but on the other hand, it's just like, man, that's wild. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've noticed the same thing. I, I've started looking for, uh, did I watch somebody draw these lines? Yeah. And if I, if I saw it happen, then I'm like, that's real art. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, I'm, I'm skeptical these days. Yeah, uh, like, if you look on Etsy, the, like, there's, like, these tumblers that people, like, print a design and heat press it and they sell. Like, it's a really common, like, side, side gig a lot of people have is selling these tumblers. Um, and Etsy has just been destroyed by creating, like, millions of designs of different tumblers. And if, like, if you have a dad who's 57 and loves to walk three dogs at once, there's probably a tumbler of a man walking three dogs that's 57 that says, oh, 57-year-olds who walk three dogs at once. Like, it's so specific <laughs> that you can buy. And people are like, that's hilarious. I'm buying that for my dad. And then part of me is just like, oh, like, there's a script somewhere just cranking these out. <laughs> uh, here's one re related to your talk. So for the, the podcast transcription summarization, um, how difficult and, and time consuming was it to get that prompt to be reliable? And, and overall, how reliable have you found it to be? Yeah, it, pretty, pretty tricky. So before, the trickiest part at first was, how do I get it to give me JSON 100% of the time so I can reliably pass what it gives me into json.parse, right? And you just hope and pray that it is JSON. And um, OpenAI, very good at it. I have never run into not getting JSON, mm. um, but I switched to Anthropic, and 50% of the time it gives me markdown. And, and no matter how much you tell it, give me whatever, or it'll say, all right, here's the description in JSON. And it's like, no, don't say anything. I just want JSON. And then you have to write a regex to try to match it. So OpenAI has this thing called function calling, which is you give it your, your types or your schema of, your, of what you're going to pass it into. So I would give it like, all right, give me a description, which is a string of 500 characters. Give me links, which is an array. And each link has a timestamp and like all that. You give it your, your types, right? And then it knows, all right, this is exactly what I'm looking for. So, um, yeah, there's that. And then just try another, the other thing is like, you get the response back and then you ask yourself, is this good? And then you run it again and it's, it's totally different. Mm. And you say like, is this good? And there's this thing called temperature you can do to make it more deterministic, but it's still not hundred percent a pure function. Right? So it's, it was really tricky just running it multiple. It's really, it was kind of expensive because Every time you run it, it was, especially using GPT-4, was, it was a buck every time I ran it. So, like, every time you, you rerun a script, it costs you a buck, and mm. then you look at it and you say, is this better? And then you're subjective as well. OpenAI has a bunch of tests that make sure that, like, because people are saying, like, oh, the, re the responses are getting worse. So now they have a way to actually measure. Are they getting worse, or are you getting comfortable with the fact that this is amazing? But now this is just regular, this table stakes for you that a robot can summarize an mm. uh, entire podcast for you. So that actually brings up something that I got a question about, but I have just a follow-up question mm -hmm. in general, um, which is that when we get, this will be the last question, when we get, uh, when we get these responses back, right, they're, they're all coming from the same small handful of models, what keeps them from just becoming completely unremarkable and homogenous? Uh, like, like the like the same, or you can read yeah, something. Yeah, I guess, I guess yeah. like if, if everybody's using AI to generate everything, and yep. we're training on the AI generated stuff. Like, is there when do we hit that like local minimum? Where yeah, we, it's it's already happening. I called someone out on Twitter the other day. I'm like, these are AI. You're you're replying to every single one of my tweets, and I can tell that this is open AI tweets. And he says, you're mm -hmm. right. Sorry about that. And because, like, yeah, you can tell it has a certain tone. And you can tell it to change its tone, but there's a limitation to that type of thing. So I think the next thing, and this is something that Scott and I want to do with the podcast, is, like, feed it every, like, actually train it on everything we've done 
and say, all right, given how you understand how we talk, the tone, the words that we use, now can we do it? Because like the tweets that they were giving us was like four emojis and exclamation mark and like hashtags and like I don't I don't do any of that, right? So I think to answer your question is we're, we're already there. You just got to work on it. Zero minutes. And with that, yeah. we're out of time. That's Wes, it. thank you so much. Thank this you. Is Appreciate fascinating. it. Fascinating. Thanks everyone for coming out. All right, y'all. We are going to take a quick. 15-minute break while we get set up for the next speaker. So have a moment. Go talk to our sponsors at the booths. Grab a coffee. Use the bathroom. Find Wes for some stickers. And we'll see you back here at the top of the hour.